Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is David Freeman. I'm the editorial director of NBC News Mock, which is all about science and technology, including biomedicine. Um, delighted to be here today to moderate this panel discussion on gene editing, uh, which is a pretty big topic, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we're going to talk mostly about uh, human health applications. Uh, we'll talk about what the tools are, uh, what does gene editing itself mean, uh, what are the potential uses to combat various diseases, and what are the ethical implications. So the panelists here, uh, starting from my uh, immediate right, George Church, a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and co-founder of Editas and eGenesis. Uh, Flaminia Caruccia, Associate Professor of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Howard Kaufman, a surgical oncologist at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey and a member of the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee at NIH, National Institutes of Health. Uh, George Annis, Distinguished Professor at Boston University uh, and Director of the Center for Health Law, Ethics, and Human Rights at BU School of Public Health. Uh, this is presented, uh, this event is presented jointly with uh, NBC News Digital, and the program is also part of the Andalo series on current science controversies. Um, we're streaming live on the websites of the forum and on NBC News Mock. We're also streaming on Facebook, and if um, we'll have a brief Q&A at the end, and you can email questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. That's the forum at hsph.harvard.edu and you can participate in a live chat that's happening right on the forum site right now. So, um, gene editing can be a powerful tool against disease, but so far its use in humans has been rather limited. We have a clip that shows, uh, tells the story of a little girl in London whose leukemia was treated using uh, engineered T cells and a tool, not CRISPR, but Talon, as a last ditch effort to save her life. It's, uh, this clip's from 2015 and is provided courtesy of NBC Nightly News. We are back with a fascinating new frontier in targeting cancer, a first success for a technique that appears to have worked in treating a little girl with leukemia. It involves a donor's immune cells that were genetically modified to fight the girl's cancer. We get details tonight from Kira Simmons. No way, no way. It's like a dream. This one-year-old girl may owe her short life to an exciting medical advance and to her parents' decision to take a risk. We didn't see it as a tough decision. We saw it as the only decision. There was no other option. Layla was dying of acute leukemia. Her mom and dad agreed to a treatment in a London hospital never used before. It seems to have kicked her cancer into remission. So far, so good. She's just, yeah, she's just well. The technique is called gene editing. Some of the body's immune system cells are removed and tweaked to recognize cancer and attack it. When these supercharged cells are returned to the patient, they act like guided missiles, targeting leukemia without damaging the surrounding area. In Layla's case, there was no need to find a matched donor because the genetics can be modified. That's the most exciting development. It's a technique doctors in the US say could be used for other types of disease, like breast and pancreatic cancer. So that sounds pretty amazing. Um, I wondered if you could uh, uh, put that in a context for us, uh, George. Yeah, I think it's a great example. Uh, for, for one thing, it shows that this is a much bigger thing than CRISPR, which gets, I think, an inordinate amount of the headlines. Uh, talons are, are just as uh, viable a, a strategy, and that's what was used in this case. The key point is that we can now not only <clears throat> add a gene, which was sort of classic gene therapy, but we can also subtract uh, or edit genes. Um, um, and uh, Th this particular kind of cancer therapy could be highly uh, personalized, but it also illustrates another interesting point, which is that um, we're getting to the point where the donor doesn't have to be matched to the recipient. That was never possible before because you couldn't edit either the donor or the recipients to be immunologically cap compatible, but now you can. Mm -hmm. And that opens up even further so that we're, we can get uh, organ donors um, as far away as um, pig to human. Uh, so this ability to manipulate the immune system through genome editing is uh, going to be very powerful, both for um, this kind of T cell therapy we saw for this little girl, but a much broader set of, of therapies um, via stem cells and, and pig organs. We'll talk about pig organs a little bit, edited pig organs a bit later on. Also, mm -hmm. gene drives, too, you did mention malaria, the use of uh, gene drives as a potential tool yeah. to in insect-borne uh, illnesses like right. malaria, but right. that's, that's another big application for this right. possibly, right? Uh, malaria, uh, Lyme disease, more close to home, um, all, all, a whole variety that are uh, not only insect-borne, but, but uh, through rodents. 
Mm -hmm. I think we do have another clip that's up, up now that we can see that's about, uh, this is a clip a video from the, the Wies Institute here at Harvard that helps explain how gene drives work. Historically, scientists have been able to alter the traits of domesticated plants and animals, but have not been able to do this to wild populations. Here we use mosquitoes as an example to explain why most genome alterations designed by humans don't persist in nature and how a recently proposed technology could change that. The transgenic mosquito, tinted blue, has an altered gene inserted into one of its chromosomes. When it mates with the wild type mosquito, each parent contributes one copy of each chromosome to their offspring. Thus, only 50% of offspring will carry the altered gene, while the other half will inherit the wild type version from both parents. Even if the altered gene doesn't reduce the likelihood of each mosquito surviving and reproducing, it may persist at a low frequency in the ocean of wild mosquitoes, or it might go extinct after several generations of especially unlucky inheritance. This process is what keeps us from altering wild mosquitoes to prevent them from transmitting diseases such as malaria or dengue. A team led by Kevin Esfeldt at the Wies Institute, the Harvard Medical School, and the Harvard School of Public Health has now outlined a way to build gene drives that can improve the odds that almost any altered gene will be inherited, potentially allowing them to spread through even wild populations. The proposal relies on the CRISPR-Cas9 system, a new genome editing technology co-developed by the same researchers at the Wies. Gene drive mosquitoes carry both the altered gene, the genes for the Cas9 enzyme, and several guide RNAs that tell it where to cut. When passed to offspring, the guide RNAs direct Cas9 to cut the wild-type version of the gene inherited from the wild-type parent. The cell then copies both the altered gene and the drive when it repairs the damage. Because the mosquito now has two identical copies, one on each chromosome, all of its offspring will inherit the alteration in the gene drive. This same process will be repeated in subsequent generations, causing the alteration in the gene drive to spread through the population. That's pretty much basically what Flamingo, what you're working on. You're working on gene drives, developing the technology to be used against malaria, dengue, Zika, and so on. Tell us a bit more about that. Yes, so as the clip said, um, gene drives are new technology uh, based on the use of uh, genetic elements such as CRISPR that have the ability to bias their inheritance and so to increase in frequency in our population. And we can exploit the, the uh, disability of these genetic elements uh, to spread desired uh, genetic traits uh, into species that, for instance, pose a, a threat uh, for human health, such as uh, mosquitoes. Uh, mosquitoes transmit a variety of uh, diseases, uh, including dengue, Zika, and, and malaria. And malaria is the most dangerous of all because uh, about half a million people, uh, mostly young children in Africa, die because of uh, malaria every year. And um, gene drives can really help uh, our fights against uh, malaria because uh, they give us the possibility to modify entire mosquito populations in the field. And how can we modify these mosquito populations? We can, for instance, uh, provide them with factors that will kill uh, malaria parasites so that those mosquitoes will not be able to uh, transmit the, those parasites from one person to the next. Or uh, we can target the mosquitoes themselves and, and introduce uh, genetic traits that induce sterility so that the reproductive uh, output of those mosquitoes will be reduced and eventually there will be fewer mosquitoes that can transmit the disease and, and even mosquito populations can be uh, eliminated from um, any given areas. And this was unimaginable uh, or very difficult to imagine before the uh, discovery of, of CRISPR and other gene editing uh, tools, but now it's a, it's a concrete possibility that can also be used uh, outside of public health uh, for, to target, for instance, agricultural, agricultural pests. There are a lot of insect pests that are a problem for, for agriculture and also to target possibly uh, invasive species uh, such as uh, black rats. And uh, um, because it's a new technology and they're still under develop development in, in the lab and there are still a few technical issues that have to be sorted, uh, but it also it's a technology that poses uh, novel risks because uh, uh, if a gene drive worked, then that would mean that it would propagate through populations and uh, the effects uh, would probably be irreversible. Uh, and so this obviously poses uh, new questions in terms of a possible impact for the environment. What if we eliminate um, a mosquito species? Uh, what would happen to, to the environment? And uh, uh, what, what would happen to the empty niche? And also in terms <coughs> of, uh, of governance, 
ones uh, who will uh, have the final word in deciding whether these gene drives uh, can be released. After all, uh, mosquitoes uh, don't stop at national borders, so this would have to be an international uh, decision. Right. Well, talking about safety and the decision making, Howard, you were kind of well positioned to talk about that. You're, you're an, 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 a surgical oncologist, but you're also a member of this biosafety committee. So can you tell us a bit about your work in, in, uh, with, uh, with, or the possibility of using uh, CRISPR and other gene, for, uh, gene editing technologies to treat cancer, and also about the kind of the regulatory issues? Yeah, so um, cancer is a genetic disease, so that's the basic problem there. And I think that we're now witnessing a major paradigm shift in how we approach um, patients with cancer. Uh, precision medicine really seeks to identify specific mutations in genes within the cancer patient and then to either um, uh, change that or to block various signaling pathways that are mediated by, by uh, some of these oncogenes. And I think immunotherapy has become very well established as a way to treat cancer. And um, I think the little girl that you saw was actually getting um, a T cell, which is part of the immune system. And these now can be manipulated to be very specific for an individual, very small peptide within a cancer cell. So as these new technologies go out, um, and one of my areas of research interest is using oncolytic viruses, which actually use a virus to go right to the tumor cell. And these can also be used as gene therapy delivery tools. So the virus that actually just got the first approval uh, for treating melanoma actually delivers a, an immune gene directly into, into melanoma cells. And, and so not only does the virus kill the melanoma cell, but it initiates an immune response. So in order to get these new technologies out there, I think it's important that there is some oversight because for every drug that we have that treats any human disease, there's always the risk of potential side effects. And with some of the new technologies, we don't necessarily fully understand what the implications of those can be. So there can be implications to an individual patient. And in oncology, it may be easy to say the risk-benefit ratio here um, is, makes it uh, valid to, to use the agent. But in other cases, there may be more widespread um, problems down the line, such as you know, environmental issues or transmission from a patient to a normal individual. So um, to address that, I think what the NIH has done is set up uh, what now is, uh, we call it the RAC, the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee. And the committee has evolved over the years. So it, it uh, became a, a protocol review body to take a look at any kind of therapeutic trial that was going on and really charged with looking at both basic and clinical activity with recombinant DNA, not to really create barriers to, to getting these things done, but rather to provide some oversight, to develop some common dialogue so that the field could be advanced more quickly and to really look for what kind of safety features we might want to watch and how to collect that information, um, in part to help other investigators who were working in this field, um, and also to really learn about this as, as these new, new therapeutic strategies get implemented. So some of the new technology today is really interesting. It's, it's very exciting, and I think that we have to roll it out we, we have to do studies to understand its real benefit, but we also have to provide oversight. And so the, the RAC committee is a public forum. It's recently been re restructured into the Office of Science Policy at the NIH. And instead of reviewing every protocol, the, the RAC committee is really only reviewing selected protocols or uh, providing policy advice in, and educational programs. So when we do see, uh, for example, the, the, t the adoptive T cells have led to some interesting side effects that weren't previously known because this was a new therapy. And we recently had a joint meeting with the NIH, the RAC, and the FDA to kind of go through the side effects and also come up with ways to manage them. So I don't think this has slowed us down. I think in some ways I would say having some regulatory oversight and some process to do this has allowed us to potentially speed up the development of these agents. Well, so there, uh, oversight clearly seems like it's a big concern for a lot of people with these powerful technologies, and there are also ethical concerns as well as safety concerns. George, you've thought a lot about that. What are, what's some, what are some of the concerns that you have about the deployment, the wide deployment, the use of these tools, gene editing in human populations? Yeah, whenever you go into a human population, for the first time, obviously, the, as we said, the major issue 
is safety and risk. What, what's going to happen? Is this the right thing uh, to do? And what we've relied upon historically uh, are two things. One, a review board of some sort looks at the science and looks at the medicine and says, yeah, this is, could be safe for humans and here are some possible risks you want to tell people about. And the second thing is informed consent, which I don't think works here. I mean, you saw the little girl and uh, her mother, and her mother said, we had no choice. We, whatever this was, uh, we had to do it. So, no, you don't. You didn't have to do it. I mean, it worked, and we, we were all happy, and it was great. Uh, it could have killed her, and she could have died a slow, miserable death, in which case we would never have heard about it, probably. Um, and trial and error is a problem, so I really think we want to build in both rigorous scientific review before we go to humans, but then we have to be realistic with humans as to what's going to happen. I think this is the only case we have, is that right, George, of, of this T-cell procedure that the little girl went through? The, it is, uh, yeah, the talon-based procedure is um, the furthest along, but there are some CRISPR procedures that are coming along. Okay, but they haven't actually been used in humans, is that is my understanding. Is that true? Uh, the Chinese have done it in well, China, okay. In the, okay, started well, in the have, UK. They have but an FDA you, just like us, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, in any event, I mean, you, you could be, you know, as the, as the NBC clip we saw, you could think from that, this is ready to go and available, and if uh, my child has this disease, I should get access to this. Uh, no, guess, not unless you go to China, apparently. Uh, but, so we do want to worry about that, and we want to worry about uh, humans. We have a lot of experience with humans, actually. Uh, with mosquitoes and going into the wild, uh, what we worry about is exactly what Flaminia said. We worry about it exploding and you not being able to reverse it, that there are no countermeasures, there's no you know, red button that you can press and say, stop it. <laughs> so you want to, I think, be sure that you have some countermeasures that you can avoid at least the known potential hazards uh, and not put something in the wild that has a major normal potential hazard. But you all, I mean, I think everyone here probably agrees the need for regulation on this kind of new new technology, right? And and uh, what's your perspective on this? You you support regulation here. Do you do you worry about that we're going to do something that we might not be able to foresee, or is that kind of overblown that risk? Uh, I'm very supportive of regulation. I think some. I mean, I think there's a stereotype that scientists don't want regulation. I, I think it protects us uh, it uh, from things like thalidomide and. Uh, Vioxx and so forth occasionally doesn't protect us. Uh, so, no, I haven't run into a case where it's slowed things down unnecessarily. Um, no, the British actually have the most uh, vigorous type of oversight in genetics and reproduction, and they're f much further along than we are. I mean, they, they wind up doing, uh, well, doing cloning wasn't in humans, but they, they did cloning, they did mitochondrial. Uh, DNA replacement. So they're more, more. I mean, is this and they have very public oversight. They have debates in the parliament, and uh, mostly the public approves of this stuff as long as it's reasonable. And that's the only question: what's reasonable? Well, I, the, the, the thalidomide kind of story kind of played out in England, right? So is that is that the kind of the origin of their concern? And is that something like one of the worst case examples, right? Right. So, well, I mean, uh, Howard, what's what's uh, are we well protected from RAC and other other kind of biosafety groups to, uh, regulation? Well, you know, the thalidomide story is a good one to bring up, I think. So, you know, thalidomide has anti-cancer activity, and mm -hmm. so it was under intense investigation for a long time. And as you can imagine, trying to write a study, you know, uh, and, and do informed consent, get people to take you it know, right having, <laughs> giving people thalidomide was a problem. And so I think by having a regulatory body to take a look at that, one of the things that we came up with was that there was a registration program. So as a physician prescribing it, and I did this, uh, I, I prescribed the thalidomide, you had to be registered, you had to report every patient in, we were able to develop a national consent form. So yeah. the bioethicists weighed in, we made, you know, really talk to the patients about the potential risks. Thalidomide is a, was a pill, it's an oral agent. So, you know, if you take that home and somebody gets into it, they could potentially get exposed. So there were a lot of issues, but I think by getting together in a national forum, we were able to address that and we successfully did the studies. Unfortunately, it didn't work at the end of the day as an effective cancer therapy, but we were able to study it. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. 
But, so, all, but it's interesting, beyond this the, the safety of humans who are involved in these things, there's also some, 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 seems to me some, some other bigger kind of more existential issues. And we talked about this, about, about this before, Flaminia, about the idea of, if, with, say, with the gene drive, we might be able to extinct a species. Like you put, take a species that's been here forever, for millions of years, and get rid of it. Does that give you pause? Or you think that the, the possibility of saving hundreds of thousands of lives a year, say, to malaria, outweighs that kind of difficult question. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting and, and, and sort of important that we are having this conversation now about the possible imp the impact of gene drives. If you think that we've been trying to uh, kill and eliminate mosquitoes for, for many decades uh, with yeah. using very toxic uh, pesticides, so it's, it's great right. that now uh, the, the possibility of using powerful gene editing is actually stimulating again uh, this conversation about the role of mosquitoes in, in the ecosystem and, and, and what would happen if mosquitoes didn't uh, exist anymore. So the, the beauty about gene drive is that they are species specific, so they are highly, highly specific for the, the species that you want to target. Uh, therefore, it's believed that the overall impact on the environment will be minimized uh, by, by the fact that you will target only one mosquito species or one insect species at, at, at a time, uh, contrary to what happens with, uh, with pesticides or insecticides, uh, for instance. However, the question of what would happen to uh, the empty niche if a mosquito mm. population was uh, eliminated is, is a true question and a true uh, uh, concern for ecologists and environmental biologists to, uh, to get together and to, and to address. And, and the truth is that we don't, we don't really understand uh, enough what, what's the role of, uh, of these mosquitoes in, in the environment. And therefore, if we decided to go and proceed with a gene drive that suppresses populations, then the monitoring side of, of, of the release of what happens after these mosquitoes are released will be really, 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 really important for to detect uh, possible un, un, unintended consequences as early as possible. So but, that we but can. But as George said, maybe it's too late at that point, right? Does that something untoward happens, and it may be ha hard to push the red button that doesn't exist, right? Yes. So with yeah. gene drive, the, the problem is that uh, if they work effectively, potentially, they might not, it might not be possible to reverse uh, uh, their effects. Although uh, there, there, would, there might be possibilities of releasing a second, like reversal drive, mm -hmm. that would prevent the first one to uh -huh. work, but of, of course there is no guarantee that that, that that would work. That's why um, monitoring and early action would be essential. Yeah, another issue, it's you know, they're weighing these, all these risks against potential to save lots and lots of lives. And another thing that's come up too is the uh, a way CRISPR and gene editing is a way to solve the. A shortage of organ, uh, human organs uh, available for donation or for transplantation. And I don't know what the number is. I think it's dozens of people die a day waiting for organs. Uh, you may know the number, but you're involved in this idea of, of, part of editing pigs, pig organs, so that they would be transplantable without immune, immune response in people, basically, right? Right. Uh, <coughs> you have uh, less issues about wild release, and, but the same issues having to do with safety and efficacy. Uh, as you have with with any drug or environmental release, uh, but the, the 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 advantage here is there are millions of people that could benefit from um, uh, a safe and uh, readily available uh, organ donation uh, if you can make it uh, the, the organs compatible and virus free. One of the things that derailed it about a couple decades ago after a couple billion dollar investment mm -hmm. was that uh, there were viruses released into the immune compromised patient. We've now shown in the laboratory we can eliminate uh, um, all of those viruses, even if there's 62 of them from the genome of the pig. So that's a, that's a fairly monumental editing task that we've now shown is, is quite feasible without causing any damage to the, to the pig itself. And how far along is that? Would you, would you hazard a guess as to when it might be possible to start transplanting pig organs into humans? <clears throat> uh, you know, I think there's, there's almost all of the component changes, maybe a hundred of them, have been tested at this point. It's now, you know, making that final pig strain, and um, probably within a year of that, uh, could be as little as a couple of years from now, we'll be doing okay. clinical trials. So. Mm -hmm. And you're, but you're smiling about this. What are you smiling about? No, you know, people have been talking about do, using different sources for transplants forever. Uh, right now, the, con the big debate now is can you use uh, organs from people who have hepatitis C, right? Because right? we can treat hepatitis C for $100,000. So you could, yeah. uh, you could do the transplant. 
uh, for a kidney and then cure the hepatitis C and basically double the cost of the transplant. I mean, from a public health perspective, really you want to put your emphasis uh, not on transplants, but on preventing the diseases that make people need transplants. I, mean, I can't prevent every disease, obviously, but, uh, but you know, we treat transplants as if they're like, and there's nothing bad about transplants, but as if they're the most important thing we do in medicine, which is weird. I just I always find that weird because it almost it's historic. It's always taken the death, the sudden death of an otherwise healthy person to be an organ donor. Now we use different people for organ donors now, but but to me, transplantation is always a public health disaster. Now, if it's a pig you're taking it from, then we don't require the death of a pig. Maybe that's okay. Some of you are old enough to remember Baby Faye, though, which is the only xenograft done in this country ever. Uh, with a baboon heart to a little baby who died a horrible death after that. Uh, and it was never done again. This is a trial and error type of experiment. Uh, I, my guess is we're going to be extraordinarily careful to do the first pig transplant. Extraordinarily careful, as we should be. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, but it'll still be trial and error. If the first person gets a bad reaction from the pig organ, we won't do them any again. What about the, the this idea of informed consent? Because all these experimental treatments on people uh, require, I guess, the, the consent of the, the, the people people being treated. Um, oh, they do. And and but Howard, is it your your? Uh, are we are we? You, and, and George, you were talking about how the woman saying she didn't have a choice here, but she did have a choice. How do, how does 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 do these gene editing techniques uh, raise any new issues about informed consent in patients? Um, Howard, yeah. Well, so, so you know everything we do in medicine, we look at the, the potential for benefit and the potential risk, and you have to weigh that out. I mean, that's what we do as uh, clinicians every day, and that's unfortunately what patients have to go through at the worst time, uh, uh, you know, of their lives. Literally. Yeah. And but one thing, I'm I'm curious to get your reaction to this. You know, 50 years ago, if you were going to go into a cancer clinical trial, the likelihood of a drug working was very, very low. I think we had like one in a thousand drugs even moved forward. Today, I think the science is much better. It's informing where we're going. And so we're able to come up with, I think, much more rational strategies. And so the likelihood of a benefit seems to be much higher. And this actually came up at one of our RAC meetings, and some of the bioethicists, you know, said, you know, maybe the potential benefit is, has shifted over the last 50 years, and we need to reconsider that in, in the consent language. Yeah, it's very difficult. I've been one of the people arguing against saying that there's going to be a benefit to this research trial because that's why it's research. We don't know whether it's going to benefit or not. Now, we may feel better about it than we used to feel, but you know, it's, it's, virtu it's very difficult to get uh, informed consent from someone who's terminally ill, and you're basically telling them, we got nothing for you, uh, except just try this experiment. Right? We have this weird movement in the United States, and I really think it's weird and wrong, uh, called the right to try. That every, there, there's like more than half the states have passed laws that say you have a right to try uh, experimental uh, drugs that have only gone through phase one, initial safety phase, I have no efficacy that we know of. They may. They may. Um, but the fact that these people are dying, they and their families are demanding something to be done. And you know that's an emotional reaction. I could totally sympathize with it. But we can't support that. We, you know, like the FDA and regulatory agencies, really, really should not support that because that is not scientifically based. And it's a big problem when we move from not scientifically based to you know, how people feel and then the people who Child, mostly this involves children who are dying, which is like the worst, right, for parents. I can't, can't even begin to think about how bad that is. Nonetheless, they're very subject to exploitation and it's very difficult to make any kind of reasoned decision. So informed consent alone can't protect us there. We really do need, but we need the FDA. But I think the only way we can move forward, uh, particularly from a public health perspective, I think, is to do clinical research. No, I'm not against right. going clinical. So the so question is, when? When are you ready to, to try it in humans for the first time? Right? Well, you know, so I so I, I I study melanoma as the disease I look at, and okay. and this is a disease where we had essentially no effective therapies for many 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 years, except maybe for high dose interleukin two. And we now have 11 agents that, that were FDA approved in the last like five years, it completely changing the field, and it was going so rapidly that. 
in, in something I've never seen in my career, the FDA was beginning to approve these drugs off phase one studies because the response ah. rates were so dramatic, including ah. some complete responses. But there was this period where the only way you could access these drugs was to go on a clinical a study. study. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as the clinician who has to kind of be the objective person and going between the consent form and what's best for the patient and what's best for the field, it became very <laughs> challenging because I do think that it would be in my patient's best interest to go on this study and get a drug where we now were getting increasing amounts of information, albeit small numbers. And so, I, you know, the, the pig transplant may not work, but what if it does work? And what if that transforms all of transplantation and this, you know, becomes a standard? It's got to start somewhere. But, but let me ask you, is, is, the, is, the, is the possibility, is the, is the idea of informed consent different now because there might be downstream effects in, in people's offspring because it's a genetic change? Is that, is that different from previous kinds of uh, uh, drug treatments? Or is it the same? Well, in some senses, it's the same because the person survives and, and then can reproduce. And you know, you'd say before they had the treatment, they wouldn't survive and they wouldn't reproduce. On the other hand, this whole argument about germline genetics, whether you should be able to manipulate an embryo, uh, which is going to grow into a child whose genes are then, the new genes are going to pass on to their children and their children, is, and we've literally been debating this for 40 years. Yeah. Nonetheless, it has not been resolved, and it's still a really good question. And, and but it's obviously the, the, the potential, the promise of these genetic te te editing techniques is so extraordinary yes. that it's hard to kind of try to do anything to slow it down or emotionally, right? We want to we want to get good news and solve things. Yeah. I mean, what, what is the biggest is the biggest thing? Malaria? Is it is it crop production? I mean, this could, has agricultural uses as well, right? If there's uh, making drugs or plants resistant to bugs or to temperature changes. What are the other big things that might be brought from from gene editing? Well, I think the in interesting thread through uh, all of those, agriculture, uh, germline, most of, the, most of the editing attention right now is, is on uh, adults or, or crops, um, is that it, you have a choice between random mutations. So chemotherapy could affect your germline, but in a random way. You can change your crops by uh, allowing random radiation to uh, which is the standard way of doing it. Um, but if you do it, in a, and that could cause allergens, you know, most allergens are the process of evolutionary time frame random mutations. Or you could do it in a very targeted way and avoid that. So I think there's a, a potential uh, for uh, people to get excited about and less concerned about GM crops, and for that matter, uh, they're already accepting of GM medicines like insulin that's produced in bacteria because there's life and death involved. And there are some crops like golden rice where there is a public health component. A million people die of vitamin A deficiency and that's a potential fix for it. But the key thing, the key new thing is, is cisgenic versus transgenic. Transgenic was kind of the, the third rail, the really hot button item where you're moving a gene from two between two radically different organisms that normally wouldn't exchange genetic material. But with cisgenic, you're changing it within, you're making a simple change like an editing a, a G to a T, something like that. That may be more acceptable than either the transgenic approach or the completely shotgun random approach. Is, is that a good argument that it's, it's happening, evolution, it's a messy process anyway, we can do it, let it happen naturally or we can intervene? Is that, is that a good argument? Are you guys convinced? Well, it's, it's, it's within the organism versus between species is the key argument. Yeah, yeah, well, the, yeah the multi-species argument, so that's a good one. <clears throat> the fact it's happening naturally, I mean, we go back and forth about that. Normally, we don't use nature as a guide. If we did, we wouldn't have medicine, <laughs> right, we just like, at all, because uh, diseases are naturally caused, too. So. Yeah. But one of, the, one of the things, just to say what's the most important thing, what's the thing the public wants the most, is where we started, is cancer. When it, you know, we want to cure cancer. We've been trying to cure cancer forever. And cancer is a genetic disease, and it does seem we should be able to work on it. I mean, we have done melanomas. You said a lot better than we did before, but most of the cancers we're not doing that great on. I think, we're, I think it is changing, though. I think we're doing better and better with cancer, and I, I do think that the, the um, <coughs> outcome for cancer patients is the best it's ever been. And I think it's been partly because we've made advances on the therapeutic side, 
but also there's been a lot of work on the prevention side, not enough. Yes, 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 and yes, and yes, these yes, things, I, I think, on. are impacting the disease. Um, and, and I think we have to continue to do both of those. And, and cancer, you know, I think is a good example where you could argue that, you know, uh, for a cancer patient to go into a risky study, they're willing to take that chance because, you know, these can be fatal diseases. I think when you go to diabetes or you go to other diseases that are maybe not um, as serious, then I think the ethical issues become more problematic. They do. But there's also the issue of making decisions based on, on big populations, right? So the gene drive brings up another issue, right? Who's going to make the decision to put yeah. release these mosquitoes in, in Brazil uh, or in uh, Africa or malaria or Asia? How do we, who gets to decide that? Whether something we're going to do this, something that might have these untoward effects, or it might save everyone's life. How do you do that? Who decides? So, so many of you. yeah, so yes. <laughs> also, go, going back to what George was saying earlier about transgenic versus cisgenic, um, not many people realize that uh, actually there are transgenic releases already happening, and and they've been happening in. Uh, starting in, Cayman, in, the, in the Cayman Islands and then in Panama, Malaysia, Brazil more recently and now they're also discussed for Florida uh, for instance um, where um, there's a UK based company that has generated this genetically m manipulated uh, mosquitoes that are those that transmit dengue virus and Zika and other, and other viral diseases uh, that um, uh, express like a lethal gene that is kept quiet in, in laboratory conditions but then is activated once these mosquitoes are released. So when males are released and the mate with field females, uh, their progeny is killed by the lethal gene and therefore those field females are virtually sterilized uh, and then if this happens over long periods of time um, and repeatedly then eventually that population can collapse and cannot transmit disease. And there's, it's been very interesting to see what, uh, what happened in Florida uh, last year during the general elections where residents of uh, Florida, the Florida, Florida Keys were asked to vote on, on this uh, on this uh, technology and uh, so the, the residents of Key Haven, that w which was the, the location where the releases should have happened, were asked as well as residents of the broader uh, Monroe County and while residents in Monroe County voted in favor of these releases, residents in, in, in Key Haven, which was the location more closely affected by the releases, voted against, mm -hmm. uh, which is, brings up also different issues of how, how general public perceives this, uh, um, these technologies. And, but also uh, there are uh, um, genetic control strategies that are used as we speak against a number of agricultural pests uh, where uh, insects are, ma are manipulated by using irradiations that render them mm -hmm. sterile. So they're not transgenic as such, but they're genetically modified uh, uh, insects that then are released and, and to suppress field populations. So these things are already, already happening as we speak. So I think uh, we have some questions. We'll take some, I think, from online first and then from the audience. Right, thank you. Uh, we do, we have a lot of questions coming in here. So, um, and they're on all different topics. So let's start with this one. It's from Christopher Brown. If gene editing becomes readily available, will it be totally exclusive, only for the rich and wealthy people of the world? Or will it be available to everyone, regardless of financial status? I'll, I'll take That's that. Easy. Uh, sure. So, so uh, I think one of the few technologies in the history of the planet that is available to everyone equally, um, so not, not nutrition, and not hygiene and clean water, is, uh, is the, and not even vaccines, until they drive something to extinction. So smallpox is extinct, uh, guinea worm and polio are, on, are close to it. And when that happens, then it is available to everybody on the planet for free uh, in perpetuity. So I think that's, that's an example of uh, if malaria is something that could be extinct, um, even without making a single mosquito extinct, and that would be a uh, benefit to everybody uh, on the planet. Sounds good, but smallpox now reappears as a bioweapon. It was the main a theory how we went to war in, in Iraq about because they had smallpox as a weapon. So uh, you don't want to oversimplify it. And things you know, nobody wants smallpox. That's a horrible disease. It's a great public health victory to do that. But in fact, there are you could continue to so-called bad could, guys. You out could there. still continue to vaccinate if you were really concerned about it. I think that's right. not an argument for why you shouldn't make something extinct. No, yeah. but but 
it's a good point. We shouldn't yes. oversimplify. It, it, there are some risks. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the other thing that people talk about is this idea of designer babies, right? That there may be a rich, poor divide. Who gets access to oh. something to add uh, to, uh, you know, enhance I mean, traits. the idea in general that everybody's going to have access to everything is just a ridiculous thing. Like, just look at the world the way it is now. Look at the United States, which we're the richest country in the world. We can't deliver basic health care to everybody. No, there's definitely going to be a rich, poor divide in this. There's no way to get around that. But, but the question is, are we, is that getting bigger or, is it, or could it get smaller? So, could it get uh, smaller? I mean, you know, there there are occasions where it does get delivered to everybody, um, or to a very large large fraction of society. Um, you know, f for example, electronics is getting delivered to a much larger set of society than than ever before. That's a great point. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and vac vaccines too. I and think vaccines. Great, thank you. So people are writing in, of course, about very specific diseases with questions about them. Um, so I'll just take this one. It's from Queensland, Australia, from Jack Doyle, a year 12 high school student. What are the legalities behind using IVF to treat genetic diseases such as hemophilia? Are there any current issues with the law? If so, what are the issues? I think this question may be referring to gene editing rather than IVF. Well, you can use gene editing with IVF. Right, exactly. Uh, I, I think you can also use you IVF. Could. So uh, I think something that's uh, not always brought out, and maybe this is an opportunity to bring it out, is that an alternative to gene therapy in some cases is genetic counseling, uh, considerably less expensive at this point, but that could change, um, which means that if everybody knows their genome, they know whether their ch children are at risk, and they can take uh, action before the disease uh, occurs. So um, IVF is not necessarily the most cost effective and it's not, a, and it's not an entirely pleasant experience, uh, whether it's f for selection or, f and, or, or for therapy. I don't think it is, uh, right now, uh, IVF plus gene therapy is not a com combination that many people are embracing, partly because the, uh, the embryos are, are uh, a complex mixture of outcomes um, so that it's just not effective yet, basically. Um, Great. And there's no law against it, but we do have a law in the United States against spending federal funds to do any research on embryos that destroys embryos or creates them for research. All right, thank you for pointing that out. So I'm just, there are, because we have a lot of questions, I'm just going to kind of clump them, but there are a number of questions coming in about why aren't we just doing this, this research on somatic cells and why can't we focus it that way instead of germ lines? So perhaps you could address that. That's an easy one. We are focusing yeah. on somatic cells. There's almost zero work on, on uh, germ, germ therapy. But it doesn't. It doesn't mean that that's, uh, the National Academy of Sciences said that there, are, there will be circumstances where that is the case, but there are 2,400 gene therapies in clinical trials right now. None of them are germline, zero out of 2,400. But uh, there is a scenario where it would be, where it could be uh, um, suitable, where you would reduce embryo loss due to now standard practices, abortion. You could eliminate uh, abortion if, if the germline were treated. So I think that's going to be a, a non-obvious uh, conversation we're going to be having going forward. Great, thank you. I don't know if we, anyone in the studio audience has a question. Yeah, good. Hi, my name is Lindsay Brownell, um, and my question has to do with the public perception of gene editing um, going forward because a large portion of the population has a very negative view of GMOs, and there are lots of labels on food that promise that the food within them is non-GMO. But the reality is that the mo most of the soybean crops in the country and most of the corn in the country is, in fact, genetically modified. Um, so there is this um, negative perception of the idea of genetically modified organisms, and I think that among the scientific community and people who are familiar with gene editing, that is the community that sees it as a big benefit to society. But I think sort of the initial introduction of GMOs into the public conception was negative. So how can we change that perception going forward or how can we ensure that the public sees genome editing as 
a positive thing while at the same time still being aware of all of the concerns that we've been discussing um, today in the forum? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, <clears throat> the public, it, the same critics of GM, I wouldn't say GMOs, I would say GM foods. The same critics right. of GM foods rarely, if ever, criticize GMOs used for manufacturing insulin and other human <laughs> protein pharmaceuticals. So that's one positive thing. We should talk about that a little bit more, distinguish between GMOs and GM foods. I think GM foods is a particularly poor choice of battleground for technology. Uh, because literally you go into the supermarket and you can't see any advantage to the consumer for GM foods. So any risk whatsoever, even hypothetical, um, raises a problem. Uh, I think the, where GM foods will change, and the USDA has already weighed in on 30 different genetically modified organisms that are, are no longer, that will not be regulated the way that transgenics are. So these include mushrooms and various uh, uh, um, plants uh, that, uh, because they're cisgenic, because they're so there's such small changes, and they're the uh, you know exactly the sort of thing you could attain by random mutation. Um, I think that it, it, that that the legislative direction is to have those not regulated, um, and that probably worldwide, but we'll have to we'll have to wait and see whether that's worldwide. And that changes the conversation in a very dramatic way, even though it seems subtle. It changes it from the line being drawn between technology, high technology and low tech, uh, both of which are tech. Um, now the line is between sort of um, moving between species and not moving between species. And I think that's a, a big improvement in the conversation. <coughs> Just real quick, I just wonder if you're talking about these kind of misconceptions that people have about these techniques, these tools. Are there other kind of misconceptions that are out in, in the public that need, we need to, you need to disabuse them of? What are, the, what are the misconceptions about gene editing right now that, that are a problem? Well, I wouldn't say disabusing the public. I don't think you want to start with the, <laughs> the assumption the public is stupid. And you, what I'm saying, misconceptions, the, are there misconceptions? I understand, but at, so almost every panel, including the National Academy of Sciences, has recommended more public discussion more education, uh, and more listening to the public as well. And I think that's right. I think the public has to be involved in all of these decisions. And they can't be if they don't understand them. So you know, in our education, we don't have to go back to that, but our education system is really horrible. And it's especially horrible in science. And you're not going to change that overnight, but you have to, I think you have to attack it there. It's not just people, even George, going in front of people and saying, Here, here's, here's what science says, and this is the end of it, so just do what I say. Not going to happen. Yeah, but I do think we have a responsibility as scientists to educate the public. I because totally I agree think with that. the perception sometimes is, is, it may be um, misplaced because they don't really understand it, and not everyone is trained in science and right. necessarily understands this, and that maybe we do need to think about how to do a better job of, of that. In some countries, 80 like China, 80 percent of the top politicians have degrees in science and engineering. When the United States is closer to one percent, I mean, so it's, it's. But it needs to be a dialogue. There needs to be more enthusiasm and, and engagement. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, let's see. We'll take this one. Aren't the health risks with CRISPR basically the same as with any gene therapy? Isn't the main issue trying to target the therapy only to the cells you want to hit without it traveling through the body and getting into other areas you're not targeting? In fact, haven't past gene therapies led to cancer in some patients for this very reason? I think this is for you, Howard, this question. Um, yes, so, um, you know, depending on what your sequence is and, and how you target it, you know, these gene segments can, can wind up in places you don't want them. And, and that's one of the reasons we monitor, um, you know, patients on these studies. Um, there was a study of an adeno-associated virus gene therapy, and it turned out that later, um, you know, we didn't realize that it could get into hepatocytes and it was actually inducing hepatocellular cancers in some patients. Um, I think that's part of the reason we do carefully conducted research and we followed the patients and that came to attention and I think these AAV vectors sort of fell out of favor because of that. There are other viruses that can be used that don't get into the genome and you, you, you don't have to worry about insertional mutagenesis and so that may be an advantage in, in using them. 
but yeah, I think that is a risk. Um, and George, you may want to talk more about you know uh, on target versus off target effects. Um, but in general, I think CRISPR is very similar to any other sort of gene therapy, and the the efficiency may be a little bit different. But I think the potential, um, you know, for for having an off target effect is still the same. Yeah, the real problem in the early days, about a decade ago, that did cause some deaths was uh, retroviruses that would insert next to an oncogene like LMO2. Um, th the possibility of CRISPR is that you have no insertions at all. You, you simply have a, a free-floating RNA and protein uh, that then uh, edit a particular site. You have instead the, the off-target, uh, but the off-target now is not random integration. It is um, dictated by the guide RNA that, that, that both determines the on-target and the off-target. So that is now controllable. But the key thing is is doing very careful uh, an preclinical animal trials and then really monitoring the human. Great, thank you. I encourage everyone to go on our chat because we do have a lot of questions, but I know we have to wrap up, so thank you. Yeah, so we just got a few minutes left. So. Um, the the uh, the if everyone can think what's a what's a single policy takeaway that your message that you like to share with with thought leaders or influence policymakers, um, who wants to go first? Okay. Well, my takeaway is we need more public discussion and and we need to actually plan for it and uh, make sure it happens. And policymakers, since they generally try to get the public's favor, should work on that. I, th I think this is an exciting time in human history when we're making big advances against many human diseases. And so now is not the time to get, get uh, scared, but now is the time to step up and have more discussion and, and really sort out the policy and regulatory issues so we can move these things forward more rapidly. Yeah, for, for me, and in relation to gene drives in particular, um, safety is paramount. And so, um, having a way to uh, assess risks associated with uh, this technology. And uh, so having cross-disciplinary um, panels and committees that can um, evaluate each case individually because the risks will be different depending on the organisms that we target and the way we're going to target these organisms. Uh, and that can set uh, recommendations for um, key experiments that have to be provided for to the general public in order to um, to uh, determine what are the risks associated, and apart from the benefits, I think this will be essential. Yeah, I, I uh, agree that we need to have um, not only more uh, d discussion of the science, but also of the economics. I think we, one of the reasons this is an exciting time to be alive is we have exponentially uh, decreasing costs uh, and quality and safety. All of these are on exponential curves, and it um, preventative medicine, I think, is preferable in many cases, uh, as we've just touched upon. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to realize the revolution here is not CRISPR, it's not editing, it's not even gene therapy. Mm -hmm. It's this whole uh, collection of being able to read genomes. It's very hard to edit a book that you haven't read. Uh, <laughs> so, And there's a lot of things you can do with reading and genetic counseling that that is uh, less expensive, less invasive, and more um, uh, better for public health uh, that just involves counseling and reading. So um, I think that's where we're about time to wrap up. If there's anything else, uh, well, I, I think the uh, people who can um, continue this conversation on the forum website right now, which is uh, forumhsph.org, um, and uh, keep things going, and I guess uh, do more, more things like this to increase, to educate the public, and, and uh, Hold them to uh, to account. I mean, the uh, the sciences to account as well as to applaud them for all this great stuff. Anyway, thank you very much. It's really fun uh, to fun talking thank with you. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the leadership studio at the Harvard T H Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.